Good morning, beloved. We are starting a brand new sermon series on the heroes of fatherhood found in Scripture. Typically, men are judged for their own actions, heroized for what they do as a manly man, a godly man. Most champions of faith found in Scripture are known not for how they raised their kids or taught them the Word of God, instead how they personally had a relationship with God, how they faced Philistines and shattered idols. Truth be told, most of those great heroes of God actually demonstrated poor examples of fatherhood, said. A lesson in and of itself of the need to balance one's life and dedication to the Lord to invite the family along with you and not be at its exclusion. But beloved, there are many examples of faithful fathers, men that put their children first and brought them to the Lord. Men that sacrificed for their nation, for their people, abound in scripture. But if you follow along this series... We will see men that sacrifice for their children, men that risk for their child's sake to encounter God the Father, the ultimate example, the ultimate ideal of fatherhood. And that is of paramount importance. Dr. James Dobson of Focus on the Family said, Our very survival as a nation will depend on the presence or absence of masculine leadership in the home. Dr. George Reckers observed that a positive and continuous relationship to one's father has been found to be associated with a good self-concept, higher self-esteem, higher self-confidence in personal and social interaction, higher moral maturity, reduced rates of unwed teen pregnancy, greater internal control, and higher career aspirations. Fathers who are affectionate, nurturing, and actively involved in child-rearing are more likely to have well-adjusted children. See, fathers are far more important than our society has led us to believe. Fathers have been seen as disposable, as unnecessary at best, incompetent at worst. Most of the entertainment material coming out of Hollywood shows or New York Times best-selling books demonstrates unhealthy relationships with fathers. And perhaps that's why we've been given such poor examples in our escapism and such low expectations in life. Perhaps that's why fewer fathers are sticking around with each generation. They assume they're unwanted, unneeded, unvalued. But the studies show just how wrong that is. William Raspberry of the Washington Post simply wrote, Is it possible to reconnect fathers to their children? To reverse societal trends that produce the separation in the first place? To fashion government policies and reshape attitudes regarding fathers themselves? Perhaps. But not until we reconvince ourselves of what used to be common sense. Children's need fathers. Thank God for mothers. Children need their fathers too. Christian Service Brigade did a study in 1995 that showed if both your parents worshipped with you regularly while you were growing up, there's an 80% likelihood that you worship God regularly as an adult. If only your mother worshiped regularly with you, there's only 30% probability that you'll worship regularly as an adult. But if only your father worshiped with you regularly, the likelihood that you will worship regularly as an adult increases to 70%. Fathers have an enormous impact on their children's faith and values. So fathers, come to church and bring your children with you. Why is it that the faith of our fathers is so impactful on our own? In no way discounting mothers, why is it that fatherhood holds such influence? Because we bring to our idea of God the Father all the love and all the baggage that we have from our relationship with our earthly father. Fair or not, fathers are important. A devoted father came into the room where his eight-year-old was dying of an incurable disease. The child, sensing that he was not going to get well, asked his father, Daddy, am I going to die? Why, son? Are you afraid to die? The child looked up into the eyes of his father and replied, Not if God is like you, Daddy. Fathers are important. And for boys to become fathers, we need to celebrate it, encourage it, honor it, study it. A study that will begin with a devoted father with a daughter that was dying of disease in Scripture. This morning, we will begin with a man that loved his daughter very much. 
She was sick. Jairus' daughter was sick, and there was only one hope in the world for her. It's not an unfamiliar story, not as a genre, not as a recent world experience. And the timeless universal relevance of a father's hope for their child is always found in Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. That's Mark chapter 5. And we're going to begin with verses 21 through 24. Mark 5, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little girl is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. The great crowd followed him and thronged about him. A father's worst nightmare. No greater fear imaginable. Men, we are notoriously closed off emotionally. We are taught to exude strength and keep it in check. Men don't cry. At most, our eyes merely sweat out weakness water. That is our story, and we're sticking to it. But for our child, the armor-piercing power of our child and a need that we are personally powerless to fix, every man's kryptonite. The strongest man in the world cannot bear such a burden and not buckle. Jairus buckles. He goes before Jesus of Nazareth, and he falls at his feet, imploring him earnestly, begging him openly in front of the crowds. And to understand the significance of this synagogue leader doing such a thing, we have to remember the conflict in the gospel. Jairus was part of the establishment, given his position very likely a Pharisee, and certainly a well-known religious leader in Capernaum. Jesus was no stranger to rejection in his ministry, and his enemies, seeking to circumvent his message, to stymie him, to silence him, were the establishment rulers. Now, not all Pharisees were bad. Some believed. Nicodemus was positively curious about Christ, but he only came to him in the garden at night, where he wouldn't be seen with him. Joseph of Arimathea would boldly ask to care for the body of Christ on Good Friday, but we never saw him or his interaction with Jesus before that. Here, now, in the streets of Capernaum, in front of the synagogue, in front of all the people thronging him, witnesses to this event, this leader, this ruler of the synagogue, falls to his knees before a carpenter's son from a small town and begs him for help. He humbles himself. Completely before the whole town, his power base, abasing his authority because his daughter needs help. And that's what fathers do. Every father is put on a pedestal by his little girl, fearing that he'll fall off. Jairus voluntarily steps down from the pedestal that he is placed on by society for the sake of his little girl. Because in that moment, He's no Pharisee. He's no leader. He's no ruler. He's a father in need. And he needs a miracle from this Jesus. So please, Lord, please, help my little girl. As the saying goes, a man never stands as tall as when he kneels to help a child. Jesus, of course, agrees to help him. The story isn't so streamlined and simple. There's someone else amongst the crowds of the Capernaums that needs help from Jesus, too. Help that's going to take some time while the clock is ticking on Jairus' daughter. The story continues in Mark 5, verses 25 through 34. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians And had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, touched my garment. 
And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This insect story is commonly remembered on its own, told on its own. But it is more than just contextually part of Jairus' story. It's integral to it. If you'll remember in our study of Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus on the way to Jerusalem, there's no such thing as a story on the way to the story. Every story, every person, even the least important person in town, especially the least important person in town, is important to God. This woman with an incurable disease seeks Jesus out just like Jairus. Just like Jairus, she falls before him in front of the crowds. Just like Jairus, she's desperate for a solution. And when there's nowhere else to go, go to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus first because he always has the answer. He is the answer once we learn to ask the right question. And just like Jairus, this woman believes that Jesus can heal. Unlike Jairus, she isn't at the top of society. She's not the ruler of a synagogue. The text implies that she was once a woman in good standing, at least wealthy enough to burn her fortune on physicians, but between then and now, it was all she had. All she has left now is hope in Christ, and beloved, that's all you need. Whether you're an import official and wealth in status that can't buy or influence away mortality any more than this poor, unclean woman on the fringe of society that doesn't feel worthy to ask for Jesus' attention, only reaches for the fringe of his garment. And her story, it teaches us that God cares about the least. Her story teaches us that God has the power to save. Her story teaches us that even the smallest of contact with the Christ possible is possible to change a life. A single word of truth, of loving kindness, and we think it is a small seed planted. But the centurion that asked for Christ to save his servant taught us that with but a word, Christ can save a life. Those woman had the smallest of touches an unclean woman, forbidden to touch others in this society, but from Jesus, a touch of kindness, that he did not respond with rebuke or refute. He didn't flinch from the other, but turned in kindness, in curiosity of who could have such a faith in him to be healed without a word, with only a touch. As Bill Gaither wrote, for he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, what joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. And if the stories weren't already linked in context, already linked in timing, already linked in the 12-year-old womb of, wound of the woman and the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, the stories are linked in the words of Jesus on the way to heal this great man's daughter. He takes the time to turn to this grown woman in verse 34, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Because onto the way of the house of Jairus, ruler of a Galilean synagogue, likely the most important person in town that humbled himself before the Lord, he looks at this humbled woman in her state, her affliction, and shows us that God saw her as a daughter in need, a daughter that's love, a daughter worthy of the heart of Christ, as much as Jairus looked upon his own ill daughter in care. Psalm 103.13, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. A moment between moments to us, a costly delay to Jairus, the most important moment in all her life. 19th century German theologian Johann Peter Lange said, this delay was her both to try and to strengthen the faith of Jairus. 
The faith of a father that will need to be strong to endure what comes next. Mark 5, verses 35 through 37. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Do not fear, only believe. Even when your greatest fears rear their ugly heads before your very eyes, even when it's life or death, even when it's just death itself staring you in the eye, do not despair, do not crumble, do not fear, only believe. Do not allow the dread that would drain the life of a man take from you the blessed assurance of our Father in heaven. Do not fear, only believe. Beyond a bumper sticker or a trendy catchphrase or t-shirt, imprint these words of the word of God onto your heart. Hold fast to these words from Christ to be able to face darkness, to be able to stand when your body would shake, to be able to not just survive, but overcome all obstacles, threats, persecution, pain. These words of life are given by God to a man in need, desperate need, a man beyond hope, a man that should be rending his clothes and tearing out his beard and openly wailing in the streets. But before he can allow emotion to overcome him, Jesus overcomes the darkness by fixing his gaze and boldly tells a childless father, do not fear only believe. Could you? I don't even have the moxie to ask you to put yourself into such a terrible position, even hypothetical. Daughters are far too precious to fathers to even entertain such a possibility. But could you? Pray that God delivers you from evil. Pray, but for the grace of God, go I. But could we, in our darkest hour, have the audacity to cling to the light? Hold to hope. Could we only believe? Fear like an avalanche, a watershed of pain rushing down upon us. Could we obey Christ and not fear? Could we look into the eyes of Christ and find life? That is our charge. That is the very essence of faith. That is what our trust in God is for. To find life beyond death, beyond fear, beyond hopelessness. Find life in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants Jairus' daughter to live. Jairus wants Jairus' daughter to live. Hanging in the balance between these two men standing in the street is a choice. To press on or to give up. To go with what I know, what I can see, or walk by faith, not by sight. To face ridicule, to face a broken heart, or face in Jesus, hope in the unbelievable and only believe. Does Jairus despair and go home alone to mourn? Or does Jairus walk with Jesus and hold on to hope? Turn with me to Mark 5, verses 38 through 43 for the conclusion of the story. Begin with verse 38. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was... Twelve years of age, and they were immediately overcome 
with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Coming back from the dead makes you hungry, apparently. And coming home late, Jairus could have been angry. He could have been frustrated at Jesus. He could have resented the woman for being healed, for jumping the queue, for delaying Jesus when his daughter needed him to be on time. But it was too late. It's too late. We can be resentful when we're not careful. When fortune favors another in our time of distress, humanity has a tendency to discount the salvation of another, the rescue from tribulation of another, when we're still mired in our own trial. Schadenfreude, misery loves company, and a host of cliches tell us the tale of this selfish heart of man. How do you smile when I cry? How do you dare allow the sun to shine on your face when the clouds remain hovered over me? How can you be allowed to be happy and have a happy ending when my world is ending? Jairus' world was ending. He was deeply troubled before he came to Jesus with the worry over his daughter's health. Before the messenger came from his house with the words any father would dread to hear. And here's this woman walking away with her blessing, her joy, her triumph, her testimony of victory in the middle of my story. This is supposed to be Jairus' story. And yet the intercalation of the intruding woman took power out of Jesus and precious time from Jairus' daughter. As studiers of the word, we know we are meant to read the stories together. We know that they are part of the same story. We know the bleeding woman's 12-year wound being healed passively by Christ is meant to bolster the faith of Jairus that his 12-year-old girl can be healed actively by Jesus. But you don't know that in the moment. In the moment, we can't see beyond our nose. All he knows is he didn't have any time and Jesus was delayed. But, careful reader, if a messenger was able to leave the house of Jairus and travel the length of the way to Jairus and Jesus with news of his daughter's death, we should be able to do the math and discover that the delay didn't matter. Not in terms of time. For the time to get to Jairus' house, it was already moved. She was already dead. Had been. And as we read the text holistically, if we look to the grand scheme of the Gospels, Jesus deliberately delays going to Lazarus for two days upon hearing of his illness, specifically so that he can arrive when it's too late. He tells his disciples this plainly that they may see. John 11, verses 14 and 15, that Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Lazarus was already dead. But let us go. That you may see the glory of the sun and believe. Jairus, your daughter was already dead. But let us go. That you may see the power of hope brought to life and believe. The lesson we are meant to learn here. Is that when it comes to man. Man can be too late. Man can wait too long. Man can miss the deadline. With Jesus Christ, there is no too late. With Jesus Christ, there is always right on time. Referring to all of the pain of persecution the Christians faced in a Roman world whose hate wanted to stamp out their very existence, Paul condenses that burden into its context, saying in 2 Corinthians 4.17, For this light momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. God is always right on time. God's timing, not ours. David was anointed by Samuel to be God's chosen king as a boy. It would take two decades before he actually sat the throne when he was 30. But God was not late. God was not forgetful of his promise. God was right on time. The Hebrew people were oppressed by Egypt 400 years, but God was not late. God was not forgetful of his promise. God was right on time. 
their toes their toes touching the waves of the Red Sea exactly when, exactly where he had appointed their deliverance. He could have gotten them there a day sooner, but then Pharaoh would have been crushed by the waves. He could have gotten to Lazarus a day sooner, but then the disciples would not have seen him overcome death with but a command. He could have gotten to Jairus' house a moment sooner, but then that woman would not have been healed from a dozen years of affliction, and this man would not have been given the spiritual fuel to look at everyone closest to him laughing at Christ laying down their mourning for his dead daughter to mock this man that just came to help and have the courage here, now, in this moment, to look that crowd of scoffers in the face, face ridicule himself, face reputation, and choose his daughter anyway by choosing to remember the eyes of the Christ and his words, do not fear, only believe. have a reason to believe. Father on the edge of despair, easily he could teeter to destruction, totter to scornful mocking. Only by walking the razor's edge of the way, the truth, and the life can he find life for his daughter, for his whole house, and refusing to be afraid and choosing And Jesus, knowing this far better than he, far better ever and even than we, Jesus feeds this father's faith. Jesus walks and words and every way, every step of the way was to be exactly when and where Jairus needed to be to believe that this man, this Messiah, has the power to save. God is always right on time, even when we disagree. Even when we know we need this blessing, this rescue, this deliverance right now, Lord. Right now, Lord, I cannot wait any longer. God is not telling you no. God knows when the perfect time, the exact right time is. Not a moment too soon to bring you closer to him. And never a moment too late. God is always right on time if, like Jairus, you do not fear. Only Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this example of the faith of the father of Jairus. Thank you, Lord, that he was unafraid to embarrass himself for the sake of his daughter. He was unafraid to face ridicule for the sake of his daughter. He was unafraid to believe for the sake of his daughter. Lord, this world is full of mocking voices and scornful answers and derision. The cynicism of this world is strong and potent, and it demands that hope in the unseen be stamped out. It demands that belief in a higher power and purpose be quelled. It demands, Lord, that we do not believe in the God of the impossible. But God, your testimony of who you are and have been throughout the history of mankind has been a God that causes nature itself, causes worries, causes probability, causes giants and walls and chariots and fierce forces to bend, break, and shatter before the prayers of a believer coming to you in earnest need. Your testimony, God, is those that have the audacity to believe big, are saved big, are shown an amazing and mighty power by your strong right arm and your amazing hand. You have proven who you are, not just in history. If we had but the eyes to see, Lord, you have proven in our own life when we have called you answer. And you always answer right on time. You come at the perfect, perfect moment of intercession in our life. When we need you, you save. Father, give us the faith of Jairus.
hold to you and to believe, no matter how many reasons we are given in this world to fear. Fear is a liar. Fear would rob us of the joy, of the assurance we have in you. Fear would have us lay down our life when you would give it to us. So Lord, let us remember the words that you gave to Joshua. Be strong and courageous because you are with us. Let us remember your words to Jairus, to not fear, only believe. And let us remember this man's choice in the face of everyone closest to him, laughing, even in the midst of his pain, at such a wild and crazy idea that Jesus Christ had the power to save his daughter's life. Let us choose the wild and crazy. Let us choose to be scorned by the world. Let us choose to be mocked by the cynical. Let us choose to be looked down upon by the pessimistic and let us choose instead to be optimistic that Christ, you will return, you do save, and we are yours. Slay our fear, God, that we may believe. In Jesus' name we pray.